We were just hearing about uh, laws and policies that exist and that don't. That's what we're going to be talking about. Those laws that exist to protect people with HIV AIDS, the role that governments play in the health of a city, and the relationship between health and pa place. And ultimately, we know that a conversation about cities is a conversation about people. And today, people are flocking to cities, and people are also being forced to flee cities. And what does that mean, we're going to ask, um, for the progress on HIV AIDS? Dimitri Daskalakis is with New York City's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He's Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of HIV AIDS Prevention and Control. Dimitri. Uh, Mindy Fullylove is a professor at the Columbia University School of Public Health, where she explores the, uh, uh, the relationship between place and health. And Brad Sears is the Executive Director of the Williams Institute. That's a think tank at UCLA's law school. It's dedicated to research on sexual orientation, gender identity law, and public policy. And finally, to lead the conversation, Indira Lakshmanan is a contributor to Political Magazine, the Boston Globe, and of course, to The Atlantic, Indira. <laughs> Thank Take you so much. And it's great to see this room with everyone so engaged in this conversation. And I hope that at the end, um, you'll also engage us with your questions. So this panel, we want to take a deeper look at city politics and specifically at the governing systems within which HIV AIDS education, testing, and treatment exist. So I think the, the object of this panel is to understand the problems, the resources, and the best practices that cities can use in conducting prevention and control programs. So I want to start out with um, Dr. Daskalakis, who I know is better known as Dr. Dimitri, to those who know him in this city, uh, by asking you about the role of cities and city governments in the HIV response today and compare that for us to what that response was like at the time of the onset of HIV AIDS. So, um, I think that actually the response needs to be identical um, in a different way. So I, mean, I feel like when a new epidemic hits a city, uh, health and government tends to sort of fortress themselves up to figure out what's going on. And then the community is sort of looking at the government to sort of have a response while they're trying to formulate it. Um, fast forward 35 years and the wall is down between government and community and also private sector. And really what the goal is, is to bring HIV back into that outbreak mode and say that we need to sort of treat HIV like it is a constant outbreak and that we need to address it until it's taken under control. So I feel like that's what we're doing now in New York City. It's sort of elevating it um, based on a lot of community support and a lot of community thinking to say this is not over and it's not malaise and fatigue. This is a fight, and it's a fight that is the same as a fight of a new outbreak, because that's how we're going to actually get to a, a resolution of this epidemic. All right. Mindy, you made famous this term root shock, talking about things that cities do to actually create these kinds of problems, problems that include HIV, AIDS, but go much broader than that. So take a step back for us, paint the picture. What yeah. are cities and city governments doing wrong now or have been doing for decades wrong that have made these problems worse? Uh, my research is largely in the United States, but the same kinds of things happen around the world, and that is that root shock is a term from gardeners that refers to when you re yank a plant rudely out of the ground and you break its roots. And this happens to people when they are forcibly displaced, and forcible displacement is going on all over the world. In the United States, we have had policies that have divided our cities by race and class and that have meant moving populations constantly. The current version of this that we're in here is gentrification, which is rapidly creating a great inversion, moving white and well-to-do into the city and poor and people of color out of our cities. So first it was white flight, now it's gentrification, coming back in. And, and a lot of policies in the middle that have done the same thing, and each displacement breaks community power, spreads disease, um, and these are government policies. So specifically, give us an example of something that governments are doing or have been doing wrong that makes it harder to prevent and treat people with HIV AIDS. Oh. Or has even you know, helped in your ideas spread the epidemic. One of the important policies in the history of the AIDS epidemic was a policy in New York City of planned shrinkage which said that the population was shrinking in the 70s and that they would shrink the footprint of the city. This is still a policy that's being promoted in Detroit and other cities that have lost population. And so they m moved people that by actually closing fire stations and then huge areas of poor neighborhoods burned down. 
and created a diaspora of those populations who were already infected with HIV and they took the virus with them to wherever they settled and created a huge epidemic here in New York City. Um, and that epidemic, of course, helped to power the worldwide AIDS epidemic. This was a, an official policy of New York City. All right, so very disturbing to hear this. Brad, you look at this from a legal perspective. Tell us about your research and what it shows about the sort of legalized um, official discrimination against people with HIV AIDS. And I was particularly interested to read a report of yours that talked about how George H.W. Bush could have included protections for people with HIV AIDS in the 1990 American with Disabilities Act, but didn't. And because of that, in some ways, discrimination against those people has become legally entrenched and even allowed. Yeah, um, so since the beginning of this epidemic, there's been an e epidemic of discrimination, of stigma against people with HIV, as well as the public health epidemic. Um, and I actually think that we have probably progressed more in terms of the public <laughs> dealing with the virus than we have dealing with the discrimination. So uh, my institute did a study uh, where we interviewed 400 low-income people with HIV in Los Angeles in 2014 and 2015, and one in five uh, reported they'd been discriminated against in the past year. I've done testing studies where I send people posing as people with HIV to OBGYNs in Los Angeles and to skilled nursing facilities. Over half of the OBGYN say they would provide no prenatal care to any woman who was HIV positive. This is in the county of Los Angeles. Over 40% of the skilled nursing facilities said they would not accept people living with HIV. So we have to do more. And today, this is legal. Today, the laws are in place. The ADA actually does cover people with HIV. Most state laws protect people with HIV. But just like we needed a multi-pronged approach to fight the virus in our bodies, we need a multi-pronged approach to deal with discrimination. You need strong laws and you need strong enforcement. Um, you also need education. Uh, healthcare providers in particular continue to need education that they can and should treat people with HIV as well as the general public, and you need empowerment. You really have to have people with HIV knowing their rights. They're the ones who are going to experience discrimination, and they need to work hand in hand with city governments to address it. And one small aspect of that, or maybe not so small, is the criminalization of people with HIV AIDS. And you have a report that talks about how it's much more common for women and minorities who have HIV or AIDS to actually be sent to prison right. with, you know, charged with intentionally trying to spread the disease. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think uh, most folks are probably familiar with this, but uh, in this country and around the world, there are laws that make a healthcare status, being HIV positive, an element of a crime. Some of those laws are so broad, you don't really have to do any more than be HIV positive in sex. Doesn't matter if you disclose, doesn't matter uh, if you use a condom, doesn't matter if your viral load is suppressed. California, where I live, actually has a lenient law that if you use a condom, if you disclose, uh, you can't be prosecuted. Uh, but we did a study that showed even under this lenient law, about 800 people have been brought into the criminal justice system because they're HIV positive. Half of those are in the city that I live, Los Angeles. 95% of those are sex workers. These are people who are talking on the street about having sex for money without actually having sex in almost every case, without knowing if they would have safe sex. The misdemeanor charge that would be filed is turned into a felony. If you look at the ages of people being prosecuted, they start at 14 years old. This is not a public health response. This is a response uh, likely to drive people away from engagement in their own health and in public health. All right, Dimitri, you have taken a very hands-on approach. Um, it, you know, you not only sit in an office as the assistant commissioner, but you actually continue to practice medicine. And one thing that I found fascinating is you actually go to nightclubs at night um, to gay nightclubs and conduct HIV tests right there in the back of a room, which is pretty full on. You're doing this at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Less and less every day. <laughs> less and less every day. So I want to ask you about that. You basically did research out of this, yeah. taking questionnaires, and you found that 78% of your patients at these HIV testing state, uh, stations that you've set up throughout the LGBT scene in New York don't believe that their behavior warrants the use of antiretrovirals, why? Is it, you know, are they engaging in dangerous behavior and not realizing it's dangerous? So um, a couple things. First, uh, you know, I really feel that all of the lessons that I've learned um, as we're developing strategies in New York City come from, this, from the ground. And so having experienced 
both moving here as a 17-year-old gay man and also working with people in risk environments, um, I think I've learned a lot about what risk looks like and really how you can um, actually deal with risk, not by calling it dangerous, but by actually leaning into it and saying that we need to sort of acknowledge that risks exist and use that strategy to change what people do in a harm reduction way. So I think one of the things that's really important is that you know we, we have harm reduction strategies for people who are using syringes, but not necessarily harm reduction strategies for people who are having sex. And the most common way to get HIV in New York City is through sex. And so I think that the idea of sort of learning about that risk, acknowledging it, in really saying that we're not judging the behavior, but rather we are providing other elements of support, whether it is social support or support from the biomedical perspective, that's how we're going to get control of transmission of HIV in New York City. <clears throat> so the lessons from the ground, I mean, are really critical. And you know, I feel that, um, again, it's not really about are they engaging in dangerous behavior, it's are they put at risk in an environment that is risky. And so it's not really what they're doing. Remember, um, I always think about this, that the fact that um, black MSM are potentially at risk for HIV higher than other populations. And when you look at their condom use behavior and their drug use behavior, they're safer. And so it's really about the milieu. And it's important to sort of then say that if you are having risk, um, you know, we're gonna teach you about ways to keep yourself healthy. And actually, you're gonna teach us how you stayed healthy, and we're gonna then magnify it out into our community. And so like I said, um, every test I did in the bathhouse, every injection I gave in a, in a sex club, really has, has molded the strategy that we're using in New York City to actually reach that really important population and change the story by not saying you're doing something wrong, but by saying you're doing something right, and let us help you figure that out. All right.